Welcome to Dorking Out. My name is Sonia Mansfield, and what's expensive? Words are cheap. Joining me is my podcasting sister from another mister and the co-host of Dorking Out, Margo D. Hello, my friend. You don't know what kind of mower you have? (laughs) Why don't you know that? But wait, there's more. Also joining us is Mary Payne Gilbert from Pink Shade. Hello, friend. Hello. And I guess my quote would be grouper. It's grouper. It's grouper. It's grouper. (laughs) I try to make you a nice dinner and you mock me. (laughs) But is it grouper? Grouper. (laughs) Welcome to the show, friend. So excited to be here. Like I said, I have been uh, preparing my whole life for this moment. (laughs) I've just been waiting for someone to ask me to talk about one of two movies, this one or say anything. I've got, I I, I know every word, every phrase. I'm ready. I am ready. I am like pumped up on coffee. Let's do it. Yeah. And you could definitely come back for say anything because we haven't done that one yet. (sighs) Right. It's no good. This so week, good. This week, we're dorking out about 1988's She's Having a Baby. It is written and directed by John Hughes. It stars Kevin Bacon, Elizabeth McGovern. She is adorable in this movie. Everybody drinks. Everybody drinks. She's adorable. Alec Baldwin in one of his first roles. Uh, Holland Taylor is in there, or as I like to refer to her, National Treasure Holland Taylor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And we got some John Aston. Eddie McClurg is in there. Edie. Edie, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I always mispronounce someone's name. It was bound to happen. So, Mary, this was your, Mary Payne, this was your pick. I want to know, did you see this in the theater? You know, okay, did you say 1988? Yes. Is it is it 89 or is it 88? No, no, I'm asking. It, it is 88. Okay, yes. Because I imagine that I saw it on Yield VCR because um, 88, I would have been a freshman in college. So probably I spent my time at bars looking for like dirty boys with stringy hair that were never going to like me back. <laughs> yes. Good been bar. There. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 So likely I wasn't going to the theater. So I probably saw it on VCR, but I've seen it so many times since then that I feel ashamed of myself that I didn't see it in the theater, but I may have, you know what I mean? It's a long time ago. I can't totally remember. I know I saw this in the theater because I was primed for John Hughes movies at the time. You know, it was all breakfast club and 16 candles for me and was like, this is John Hughes. He's doing like a quote unquote grown up movie. I can't wait to see it. And, you know, of course, I saw it and there wasn't really much for me to relate to because I would have been 17 at the time. But same. Yeah, right. I was. Yeah, I was. uh, No, in 88, I was 20. But still, no, nowhere near understanding. This just like solidified my love for Kevin Bacon. Yes. And it's Elizabeth. Now, it's so crazy if anybody's watched Downton Abbey that Elizabeth McGovern is the same person, you know. Yes. That's the mom on Downton Abbey because Mm -hmm. of that. Because of the regality and the accent and whatnot you know it's so crazy that this is my first introduction to her was this movie and i was like i should cut my hair short and look just like that you know i wish i could honest to god i would wear that haircut in a second if i could i saw this on the yield vcr as well i saw the the reviews for it i remember very clearly because they had the clip of her in bed screaming for her husband to have sex with her Yes, and, you know, come to bed right now, sweetie. And and I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna see that. I, I, was, cause I, was just, <laughs> I was just like, I don't relate to this. I don't, I don't understand what the what they're doing. I like his high school dramas and his stuff like that. So, and I, I will say that. So this is the first viewing I've had, and it came out <sighs> February 5th, 1988. I haven't seen it since maybe 1988 or 90. Yes, uh-huh. same. Um, I haven't seen it since the theater. Oh wow. First of all, how beautiful everybody is. Elizabeth McGovern, Kevin Bacon, Alec Baldwin, problematic guy. Yes. He yeah. was a subject of what a great, how gorgeous he was back in the oh, day. Yeah. So Breathtaking. Hot. So hot. I mean, I mean, fan yourself. He's freaking hot. <laughs> yeah. It he's was a guy this and Working Girl, right? They both came yeah. out yes. like 
around the he's same the, time. He's the guy Scott's I was at landing. at the bar. Yeah, I was out looking for him at a bar when I yes. should have been in the theater watching this movie. But, you know, I also looked up that girl that played his uh, slutty girlfriend that didn't care that her mom died. Yeah. Yes. Um, and she hasn't done much since. She's a director now. I, that's what I started doing when I was watching it again. I started like, what happened to, right. you know, this person, that person? But the things that my friends and I constantly say my friends that are, you know, my age live around here. We say all the time, grouper, it's grouper. And we also say the little boy with the impetigo that drew the boobies on the doll. We say that all the time. <laughs> this is, oh apropos, of, apropos of nothing. We go, you know, it's the little boy with the impetigo that drew the boobies on the doll. We do that <laughs> one. And then we say, you could sleep in this bed. You can't sleep in this bed anywhere but in this bed. And she does her arms across. Yes. Oh my God, so many good quotes. And then, my friend, Mary, who on our podcast, we refer to as GMA Mary, because I get my news from her. She watches Good Morning America <laughs> and then tells me the news because I uh, don't like to watch the news. So GMA Mary, uh, we uh, she went through a lot of uh, fertility problems with her husband. Th their kids are teenagers like my kids now, but back in the day. And so she really related to it with the, um, okay, it's time. I'm ovulating. You could come upstairs. Right. Hi, hi, babe. Here's this. Lift your hips and wear the boxers. And you can watch TV if you're bored. You know? <laughs> She's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, I, you know. I was like a good, like, 10 years later, I could relate to it. Like, because I had friends going through it. But at the time, I'm like 19, 20 years old. I like, I'm mm -hmm. like what does this have to do with me? I didn't care. Let's go through the story just a little bit like yeah. for those, because this is not one of the more well-known of the John Hughes oeuvre at yes. the time. I think like yeah. planes, trains, and automobiles came out around this time. And I think that's one of his, I, that's my favorite. I think it's one of his more beloved projects. Mm -hmm. Maybe I also said to you, Mary Payne, when I was on your excellent podcast, Pink Shade, talking it's about Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, um, how much I love Mr. Mom. And I usually I get a Kate, like he, he married his high school sweetheart, John Hughes. And I get the idea. He did, he did like suburbia. He liked being married, like being a father. He, he took, he, this is a film where he kind of dissected all that and yeah. was like, and for me, it's a story about a guy that every step of the way in his adulthood, he acts like a martyr, like he's going through the worst possible thing in his life. And he's, from what I understand, he asked her to marry him. I mean, he's in love with her. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I mean. You he, asked for this. You, you <laughs> asked this, I mean, this beautiful woman, very understanding. And it's that old, like, 50s, 60s idea of like, oh, the ball and chain. And but he marries her and then it's him like, OK, he wants to be a writer. So you have to be an ad man first, which is a totally reasonable direction. A lot of people do start that way. So he goes to Chicago. He becomes a writer. Then they get a house. And he underneath all of this, it's like he's unsure who he is and what he's you know, it's th that kind of angst. Yes. And there's a lot of like fanciful scenes. There's a whole scene with the lawn lawnmowers and the men and the women dancing. And the so streets, great. So great. Is, uh, yeah. But it, I feel like there's two, three different movies being in <laughs> for <here>. sure. <laughs> and I'm like, and then for me, it was like, okay, because I liked the fanciful stuff, but then uh, well, we'll, we'll get, we'll get through it. I mean, I just, okay. So overall, I, wanted to beat Jake into a pulp. <laughs> I wanted to put him into a burlap sack and have the kids in the neighborhood beat him with baseball bats. I just oh, like, no. he's entitled. He's a brat. He's married to a wonderful woman and he's constantly moping and he's constantly just feeling sorry for himself. I say this at the same time, I'm so sexually attracted to him. For sure. I He's lucky. Was. He's played by Kevin, by Kevin, Kevin Bacon. Bacon. Yeah. And tidy whities <laughs> did something to me that I hasn't been done since like Robbie Benson in ice <gasps> castles and tidy oh, whities. Oh my gosh. I was, yes. I, I really, I, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say this. I hit the Roku button and I put it on pause for a second. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I hit that. 
<laughs> no, that's but the funniest part of that scene where he's in there and he's trying to do reverse psychology with her. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, well, I'm just gonna go to bed now. Woo, got a big day. I'm tired and all this. So funny. And then he's doing those lifting of the weights, and then she comes in and is like you know, waving her arms around the room, like, what is the smell in here? And then um she picks up both the weights with one hand <laughs> and throws them into the closet. <laughs> Like there's so many like little John Hughes things in this yes. movie. The best one being that you may not notice on first viewing, but on second or 400th viewing, you may notice <laughs> when he pulls out of the driveway to go to the, you know, which is also very John Hughes, like the backing out of the driveway super fast and driving off and then realizing he doesn't have her and backing back up to go get her to go to the hospital that his car tag says shab. She's having a baby. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's lots so of those. lots of those little things in there. It's just like um, my other one of my other favorite John Hughes movies, a sleeper hit, uh, Uncle Buck. Yes. So many of those little things Uncle in there. Buck. You guys, Uncle Buck, I'm going to say, I don't know, like eight, nine years ago, I told my kids, I go, you know what we should do? We should just have like a movie night and watch these movies that I used to love. So I put on Uncle Buck and my kids were, I don't know, like um, sixth and fourth grade. No, no, not appropriate. Not appropriate. Oh. It's oh. a lot of inappropriate stuff in that movie. But they didn't ha- but they didn't have PG thirteen back then. So everything's PG, but it for sure would have been PG thirteen for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's another one that like this one you look at it, you're like, wow, this is like Alec Baldwin and that girl like are full on naked having sex, you know? Oh yeah. I mean there's a whole I there's stuff I really like that felt real to me. Like I know people who had in-laws who talked the way like the parents yeah. talk to them yes. about having kids and being very much like I don't have a picture on my I mean I know people who went <laughs> through that yeah so funny and that, that really yeah that that rang true to me and uh I, I also like the, the actress's name she was on soap and she plays the mother. She was the mother-in-law. She said, like, oh, I had a baby. And it, it, it totally comes to her later. Like, I had a baby. It was breach. It was very painful. Nobody listens to her. And then right. it turns out that, like, her daughter had the same problem. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's little things there. Like, there's sometimes where it's very serious, this movie. And then there's sometimes where it – and it's – when Alec Bal- so Alec Baldwin is his best friend slash nemesis. Mm-hmm. And Alec Baldwin um, shows up with the girlfriend. So Christy and Jake get a house. They how do they afford that house? It's gigantic, right? I guess, you know. I'm like, yeah, wow. Um, but anyway, they get they show up at the house with this with this stripper girlfriend. It was like <laughs> the video. That's not. I remember, I remember this time. Like it couldn't get on MTV, but I was wearing a thong and I was bending over, but you couldn't see anything. It's Kevin Bacon's like, oh man, that's not okay. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Me laugh. Christy's like, "What are you doing?" But, he, goes, uh, he goes, "He goes, we, yeah, oh yeah, LA is great." And she goes, "We've never been to LA. Never goes, been, We've been, to been to LA. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in New York. I hate everything else." <laughs> <laughs> but then he says, "Oh, don't be silly. Stay here." I'm like, "You fucking asshole!" <laughs> oh, and when the girl says, "She goes, oh, I'm so sorry about your mother." She's like, "You and Neiman Marcus." You're right. Like, wow. That girl had like a um. She had like a, a a bracelet. What do you call it? Like a a belt around her calf that was like a knife. Yes. <laughs> She's bad news. She's yeah. bad bad girl. Yeah. Oh God, I loved that. I loved everything about it. And I'm very sorry to hear you saying it's three movies in one because it's not. It's cohesive. <laughs> it's Tell cohesive. <laughs> it's cohesive. It's cohesive. It's in these moments when he's out there trying to figure out the lawnmower when he doesn't even know what it is. And those guys are like, how do you not even know? And they're screaming, it's the flywheel. Because these guys have totally married themselves to the suburban life and, and, and they love it. And they or or they don't love it or they just resign themselves to it. And Kevin Bacon sees like, this is what I'm going to become, right? I know. Right. That in 10 years, I'm going to have kids running around this party and I'm going to be talking to some dude about his lawnmower and the new hot wife's going to come in. And I'm going to be like, if your uh, if your wife looked like that, would you be upstairs writing the book? You know, and, and I, I don't I don't think I think that in these moments when he sees the absurdity of the suburban life, that's when sort of his mind wanders into like the dancing with the lawnmowers and all that. 
So would you think it's like that's really John Hughes, like really just flights of fancy in his brain because he was kind of the straight laced guy. But then he was he was an ad man, but then he was writing stories for National Lampoon in the 70s and early 80s, which was kind of like this dirty comedy magazine. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that was like really a part of him. I wish uh, we could ask him, but alas, we cannot. No, yeah. no, and it's it sucks. He died. He was fifty eight. That's when young. He died, That's young. Which is just terrible. Um, what are your favorite scenes, Mary Payne? Like, like, um, well, what do you think of a, like, um, do, what does Christy see in him besides the hotness? <laughs> <laughs> Convince me. <laughs> well, I think I, I think he's. I think he's very sweet and I think he's a very good boyfriend and I think he's a, I think he is a very good husband. Like you see those scenes where he's like running to the train and then he comes back to kiss her and I think they are very in love. And in those scenes, like when they're arranging the furniture in their first house and they've got the pieces of paper out and he's like, we can't even afford this. And he like throws it in the <laughs> thing. You know, that's very typical. And I think that would you see them having these co these real conversations about the parents or you're they're coming over or whatever and she sort of stands up to him and sort of you know she mm -hmm. she looks like a little angel and in all the scenes before that we had seen her just looking like an angel in her wedding dress it's so sweet mm -hmm. and you wonder like first of all you wonder the whole time like why does Alec Baldwin hate her right I have because so I have so many questions about Alec Baldwin and Christy <laughs> and why he why does he hate her? It's because he could never get a girl like that to like him. You know what I mean? Because she, you do see in those scenes, like with the one with the furniture, that she she is a real person that talks and fights with him and is like, no, I'm not, bu bu you're that you're full of shit, and like walks away. Whereas before that, really, you've seen all this like sweetness, sweetness, and then you see like, oh, okay, they actually have a little a little fire between them. You know, she mm -hmm. understands, she understands him and she understands that he doesn't, he wants to like live in the city and all that. And she's like, no, no. And you know, it's not going to work for you to go back to school. You just need to like, you know, let it go. And she's not going to be a stay at home mom and make three types of uh, fish for dinner. You know, they're like, <laughs> they, they quickly realize like, this is not what we want. You know, we want to live in Chicago. We want to be those people. And she wants to be her parents. She wants to move to the suburbs, which leads me to believe that the parents probably, Gave him a huge chunk of money for that nice house. You know, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, she sees, yeah, when you see them together, together alone, you do see what they have. I do want to ask you guys about, okay, but the music in this movie is incredible. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, we got another uh, Kate Bush resurgence at the end there. But <laughs> Yes, um, yes, I noticed that too. That uh, That scene, you guys, you don't know this about me, but I have, have a c cold, black, dead heart. I don't cry about anything. <laughs> Stop. Oh, really? <laughs> you do not. This I do. I don't cry about anything. It could be like a serious family issue. And I just, I, I, I get it from my mother. I just, I'm like, I could, I've told this story before at my rehearsal dinner. My dad is up there like, my third daughter, my baby is leaving me. And he's up there crying. And I'm up there like, oh, my God. <laughs> and my mom and I are both looking at each other with this plastered smile on our faces like, this is so embarrassing. Like, we just, And then my husband's <laughs> up there crying and hugging my dad. And my mom and I are sitting there like two cold bitches like, ew. <laughs> Like, ew, what's with the crying? But the end of this movie, the end of this movie, every time it gets me, I got a little, I get a little verklempt at the end with the whole Kate Bush song and the. Oh, that's, you, it's a beautiful the, song. It's, it is. It is a beautiful it, song. And I love the nurse, I think is an unsung hero and should have been an Oscar award winning <laughs> actress. The nurse that is walking him into the room and he's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, that goes over your clothes and he's like okay <laughs> so all right and he's just like loosey-goosey like walking in there and she's like pulls him out real quick and, and he's like no no there's a problem you have to come out and he's like what what that's my wife and she's holding him and she like grabs him and shakes him and was like if you could just stand here mm -hmm. i could go find out what's going on and come back and tell you like stop and she like grabs him and yells at him and i'm like who is this actress she's incredible yeah that that whole sequence um it is like another movie to me that yeah. it is. It, it's a very serious thing that she's going through. Elizabeth McGovern is is amazing in this movie because she's being asked to do 
so much in yeah. this film. And she's anchoring all of this because she, she, she yeah. is. She's the movie's MVP for sure. There you go. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, she's she absolutely is. And you're terrified for her, like what she's going through. You you could feel her pain. Like I it was like I never want to give birth after I saw that. But <laughs> mm-hmm. it, just, it seems very painful but and then you're then then she's fine i mean she's making it but it also kevin bacon's a good crier he He really good crier he got he he really sort of seemed to and they both became parents you know individually like a year or two later which is always crazy to think about because like then their kids are like in their 30s now it's like right like that that baby they had is like 35 or something yeah stop I know nothing about, I know nothing about, you know, we know a lot about Kevin Bacon, of course, and Kira Sedgwick and all that, but we don't know, uh, I don't know much about Elizabeth McGovern at all, other than she was in a bunch of movies and was in Downton Abbey, and she's so cute to look at. Um, I mean, I think she's married to the British guy that created Downton Abbey. Oh, I didn't even know that. (laughs) She's married to a British person. She was in Ordinary People. That's when I first... Uh-huh. discovered her um she's really good in that movie uh and she was in a movie with sean penn and madonna did the theme song live to tell oh she's yeah really good she was engaged to sean penn for a while um she yeah she moved to england and she really didn't kind of come back to american popularity until downton abbey and she's she's beautiful and she's she's just amazing yeah. and to she, watch she is really good in this movie and that song that song mm. is doing a lot of work in that scene and i know it was yes. and i know it was written for the movie it feels like it's written for that scene but i'm kind of team margo on this one and that i feel like it's a couple of different movies going on and mm. i the by the way i once again super love the song and like i don't think the but and it's so the song is super like people still love the song, but I don't think they think about she's having a baby. Well, I do. What, I know you do, but I'm going to say like the way that people think about "Don't You Forget About Me" from the Breakfast Club is so tied to the Breakfast Club. I don't think this woman's work is as tied to she's having a baby. But that whole scene, like there's this these flashbacks of him remembering all these great things about their relationship. And I I wish that we had seen some of that sweetness earlier in the movie between, Mm -hmm. between them, because the movie is like mainly his point of view, which is, you know, fine. And, but I would have liked some of those cute little moments throughout, throughout the movie so that I could root for them a little bit more. And I have a million questions about Alec Baldwin and Christy. Like, I feel like there's a second movie here that maybe they cut it out because they're getting married at the beginning, Christy and Kevin Bacon's character, Jake, and Davis mm-hmm. is there and they actually cut to Davis and then they cut at her like looking at Davis. And I'm like, right. does she know the whole time that Davis is in love with her? I'm sure. Yeah. I'm or. Sure. He He has tried to pass at her or something. I think he has made a pass at her in the past. And I think that he has tried to sabotage their relationship at every turn. And she hates him. That's what I think. Yeah. And is he, is he trying to sabotage the relationship because he wants her for himself? He wants a drinking buddy. He wants his buddy that he can go out and score chicks with. You know, he might be in love with both of them. Mm -hmm. It could be. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. That'd be a sandwich I could get into. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, and it's so interesting because that character also, he basically, he delivers the line of the movie, which is you'll be happy, but you just won't know it, which is really like the thesis yeah. of this whole movie. And it's delivered by Alec Baldwin's character. There, mm-hmm. It's just, there's a whole, there's a whole other, there's, like Margo said, there's like three movies going on here. And like, I think this movie's trying a lot of different things. And I, to- by the way, I don't, I respect that. I'm like, hey, I like it when a movie tries things, by the way. It's way yeah. better than a movie that isn't trying to do shit. So I, I, I appreciate that about it. I'll, I'll say this. Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Sonia. You're um, fine. Okay. Um, I just, I, I didn't like it as much as Mary Payne loves it. 
Um, but I, uh, I find it very watchable. And I find, yes, I do feel like there's three movies going on. The whimsical parts, though, they don't always work, but they're always watchable. But sometimes uh, there's a scene where Kevin Bacon, for some reason, they can't hire an actor or a model to be a model in an ad shoot where he's holding a baby, yeah. which is something he supposedly wants one day, but he's just like, Ugh, this baby. <laughs> then he's running around and there's these women in their models and there's a model following him everywhere in Chicago. Is it in his mind? Is it in memory? Is it like, is he imagining it? Is it real? There's a point though where I was kind of laughing because I'm like, he's there with this baby and he's kind of like trying to hit on the models with the baby like in his arms. And I'm like, oh, John Travolta did that. And look who's talking. And it was very funny. <laughs> and look who's talking. And then I looked at the trivia and they tried to get John Travolta for this movie. Oh, that's funny. Oh, well, right. Oh, yeah. The thing about the model, I looked her up too. The thing yeah. about the model is, first of all, that. So I had the whole soundtrack, like I'd put it on my cassette, you know, put it in of my, uh, I put it in my. She loves Jezebel, y'all. This is a good uh, soundtrack. Yeah. yeah. So that song, D -d 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 Desire, that song. Shook, shook. Yeah. And when they're at the, at the, at the, at the club and he's um, <laughs> looking over and he sees her and he looks back and he looks back again. And then he, you know, he envisions himself like all alone and she's all alone. And then of course she comes into the bathroom and then he panics, you know? Yeah. And There's you 20 urinals? Yes. <laughs> so many. And all, it would it's be all like. On top of each other. Yeah. All, yeah. Hi, how you be, doing? Bread and butter? <laughs> you'd be standing in a semicircle. A semicircle <laughs> with all your butts together. Yeah. Yes. It was. um Crossing it, swords. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, well, the thing is, yeah, my thought was, is this a figment of his imagination? Like that girl really was not looking at him. And then he sees her again. And I can explain to you why he's um, holding the baby because um, they want all of the ad execs that worked on that diaper ad to do a photo shoot for the company. It's like a 50th anniversary of this diaper company. So they want the actual ad execs in the photo shoot. They say that okay. at the beginning, the photographer explains it. Cause he's like saying to his buddies, like, why do I have to be in this? Like they want everybody, uh, they want everybody that works on the campaign to be in the photos. You know, this movie. Yeah, you do. So well, I'm not going to let you say that it didn't make sense. Cause it made sense. <laughs> <laughs> tell you right now. I love passionate people. I absolutely do. No, you, I, you, you're right. I, I shut the fuck up. I I say you are. I like all the cast in here, by the way. It's all yes. huge people, great Chicago actors. I like yeah. Chicago. I want to go back to Chicago. Yeah. Same so, city. The dude that plays uh, the neighbor. So there's the two the two neighbors that sit at the uh, family barbecue. The ones that are like, you know, uh, when the wives look over and like, I wonder what they're talking about, you know. <laughs> And then they look down, they're like, by the way, another line that my friends and I probably say even more than grouper is you burn the dog. You burn the dog. say that all the time. It's like, you didn't do, you haven't done one thing to help for this. I washed the dog. You burn the dog. <laughs> poor because of it, poor you know, dog. He has, the, he has the wrong hose. He has the wrong hose. It heats up and it burns the dog every time. And so those two guys, the thinner of the guy, I had literally just seen in a movie and it may have been blackbird on apple tv i can't remember i had just seen him in a movie like that day something i was watching the he shows up oh. yeah he shows up in stuff all the time no and and john Aston was in beverly hills cop which we just talked about a few months ago mm -hmm. and he's always good yeah and what I he's mean, doing as the and the the parents i mean just yeah holland taylor just like doing what she does just being the bitchy mom and even 30 years ago still doing it you know she was probably like my age at the time you know they're trying to yeah. make her look I'm like she was older. Yeah. Do you remember her on bosom buddies <laughs> yes bosom yes. Buddies. yes of course yes she was middle-aged then holland taylor mm -hmm. was just born that way she's like yeah she's, she's like um like like wilford brimley like yes. she's just born <laughs> that way like and and i love her by the way love her every time love. she shows up i'm like Oh, thank God, Holland Taylor's in this. Like, she's just one of those people. 
I know we're jumping around and I'm sorry. No, I you're like fine. You guys, I feel like you guys that's have asked me a it. question and then I go off the rails. No, that's I'm what we do here at Dorking def- Out. I'm de- defending my movie. Defending it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to, I do. I do want to talk about the Alec Baldwin, yeah, uh, Christie thing. Okay, so when he comes to the house when his mother dies and he shows up at his, you know, at his best friend's house and he's been in New York or whatever, and then there's um, she comes down and he's sleeping in the study or something or wherever, and she comes down and he's sitting in the study and they're talking, and she tells them like, oh, we're trying to have a baby, and he's like, is that what he wants or is that what you want? Like he has always hated her. Because he loves her, right? Yeah. He wants what his best friend has. He yes. wants that. Yeah. Him as much as he acts like it's not him, like he he wants it. But I did think it was very weird at the end when they stand really close and he's like, kiss me. And she's like, no, like I'm going to bed before, you know, I say anything mm-hmm. I regret or whatever. And she basically is like, don't ever come here again if you're going to act like that. Like we're, you know, we are adults and you're still a child. And she puts him in his place. And I think that's why both of these guys love her, because she will put them in their place. Mm, that's a good call. But that I, scene yeah. was very strange because you're like, wait, what? He's going to try to kiss his best friend's wife? Yeah. What? Yeah. What? Huh? Well, and does, he wants it, more than that. Yeah. And he's and he's also he's super hot. Let's not forget that. Very. <laughs> he's used to women falling all over themselves. Yes. I would have. Honestly. Same. Like. It's very hard when you see, I don't know if you saw recently, Alec Baldwin, ugh, what an asshole. He, he did an interview with Woody Allen uh, on Instagram. Yeah. Wait, was, wait, wait, wait. What? He interviewed Woody Allen on Instagram. Woody Allen, who's really in his senior years, like, I don't know how things work. What's in Instagram? I don't know. And his, it's, and his internet kept going out and the Wi-Fi kept going out. And Alec Baldwin <sighs> would just, is just... Oh, it's such a Why? mess. Why? Why is he interviewing a, him? Alec Baldwin is just struggling. He's he's had a messy, terrible year, and there's somebody who's dead, by the way, because of it. I mean, yeah. there's there's which he's like, and uh, that's a whole other thing. But he's trying to do a talk show on Instagram, and he has Woody Allen on there, and it's unintentionally hilarious. He's talking to Woody Allen and. Of course, the internet's going out because, of course, because the internet is like, don't talk to Woody Allen. (laughs) Woody Allen's like, I don't know gadgets like radios and record players and tape recorders. Like, they live in the same city. Why couldn't they have just sat down together? Um, Hello, I mean, but Alec is in the Hamptons with his twelve children and his, (laughs) you know, Spanish wife. But he, but at one point, allegedly, allegedly, yes, exactly. (laughs) And the, the internet goes out a couple of times on Woody's end, and Alec just loses his temper. He's being all cool and fun, and then he jumps up, and then he jumps to the door, and he yells to the door to his, you know, housekeeper or assistant or something. But he's just like, I need somebody to help me with it, blah, 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 blah. And you can hear his kids screaming in the background. No. He's a mess. Oh, he's Alec. A goddamn mess. And it's so weird. Because I was telling to somebody who's a lot younger than me, I was talking to them about Alec Baldwin recently, and I just said, you have no idea how hot this guy was. Like, when he was on Knott's yes. Landing, mm. his first few movies in the 80s, wicked hot. Like, just stone-cold sexy. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sure he worked at Studio 54 back in the day. I mean, you had to be good-looking to work there. He's, he, I'm sure, and I'm sure as the character, he's used to men and women just falling all over themselves to be around him. Yeah, I'm sure. And she saw through the bullshit. Yeah, she yes, totally. She saw through it and was like, "You can be friends with him, but not, don't include me in this." You know, and she trusts Jake implicitly. She does, even though you know when the, the when he comes to the house with that um, stripper girl actress, whatever she was, and she's just leaning back on the couch, side eyeing her husband from behind, like, "Well, we've never been to L.A. Well, of course we've never been to L.A." Um, L.A. is fine. I won't puke if I'm in L.A. <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We love L.A. Well, we've never been to L.A. I feel I mean, like he's trying to be polite to her. It's like a guest in his house and she's not. She's being... also yeah. spreading his her legs in front of her. I mean, I'm yeah. sorry. Some blonde did that to me with my husband sitting next to me. She's 
better be grateful I don't punch her. No, I think he's trying <laughs> to still act like he's cool. He's still yeah. trying to be like, I'm yeah, be cool. yeah. I'm, because that's later on that scene when they're smoking in the kitchen, and Alec Baldwin picks up the um, the creamer thing, and goes, "What's this?" He was like, "That's my udder, buddy." <laughs> <laughs> it's like. <laughs> There's so many good lines in this movie, guys. There's so many good lines. I'm just telling you right now. I, I, te- so, I, te- I literally texted my friends and said, guys, guess what? They literally just wrote back a bunch of like, you burn the dog. It's Cooper. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That, yeah. You There's can sleep like anywhere, but not in this. I yeah, but not about. in this bed. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you right now. It is. So question. Yeah. Mary Payne. Mm-hmm. This is what we ask our guests. Mm-hmm. This okay. is what Sonia and I ask each other. Yes. Because normally it's just us. Are they still together, this couple? Are they still together all these years later? Yes. Of course. Yes. <laughs> of course are they, they are. Grandparents? They are grandparents, and they have literally turned into their parents. They are sitting at a table, and, and Kevin Bacon is like, still. by the way, Kevin Bacon is still at the ad firm, just like that other guy. <laughs> he's yeah. still there. He's a, he's a VP. He But he's writing books on the side. He's just like, the funniest thing is that was the other ad guy was like, I left one time, tried to write a book. I was back after six months and you'll do the same. The I way, feel like yeah. all of that is exactly Kevin Bacon's trajectory. Totally. And it's that's the normal trajectory. Like right. a- almost anyone who has a career where they work in words, and that I include myself yes. in this, by the way. Yeah. Also same. is like, I'm going to write a book. I'm fifty two or I'm gonna be fifty two and I'm like I'm going to write a book. I still think I'm going to write a book. <laughs> we all do. You're going to write a book, Sonia. I am going to write a book, by the way. I'm working on it. But like, we all think that. It's yeah. It's totally normal. It's like one of the most relatable things to me in the movie is that he gets this job writing at an because he wants to write. And so this is totally normal. And he's going to write it on the side and if maybe nothing will come of it or maybe something will and he'll just keep plugging away. Yeah. And a lot of people start in Chicago at ad agencies, you know, mm-hmm. they pay well, it's a good job. And you, you, you know, Bob Newhart did that. The guys that started Mad Men, like they, that comes from that, that time. I mean, it's a totally decent line of work and it's a totally fine way to live your life. It totally makes sense. What does Christie do? Does anybody know? I don't know. They, they mentioned a, like a corporate job, but they don't really say what it is that because I remember. She had, she, <clears throat> she had her master's degree and they were going back for him to get his master's degree. And then he gave up um, and she was like, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to be a housewife. So I don't know if she just like once they got to Chicago, she was like, he's going to go to work. I'm going to be a, you know, stay at home. Mom. There was no work from home then. So she wasn't like in her home right. office. I think because the movie is so centered on his point of view that it's yeah. sort of like not important, you know, yeah. but I do think at the end of it is one of the, you know, these John Hughes movies at the end, you have to wait till all the way at the end because you got to see all the credits at the end and all of the celebrities naming the baby. Yeah. I mean, so funny. There was uh, one person in there that said Bunky. Okay, now Bunky is what we call our uh, listeners, the pink shade Bunkies. And I like <laughs> took a screenshot of the team. I was like, ah, Bunky. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you got Magic Johnson on there, like baby Magic. Who wouldn't love that? And then at the end, we don't even know what they named the baby. Right. They don't even say for sure. I, it's a mystery. I yeah. didn't stick through the credits. Now I have to go back and like watch the credits. Oh, my God. I missed it's, it. It's all it's like Ferris Bueller comes out of the shower and looks it's like all these like um, John Hughes characters come yeah. out. Yeah, it's all like right. Woody Har- like Woody Harrelson is standing there, like giving his opinion of okay. what the baby's name should be. I, it's hilarious. I am going to go back and watch the credits because I want to see that. Olivia Newton-John, Roy Orbison, Roy Ron Orbison. Kent- that's right. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow, William Shatner, John <laughs> yeah. Candy. Yeah. John Candy John- was was John, John Candy had and um. Candy? And uh, Dan Aykroyd, you know. Holy shit, Ted Danson? Yep. Nobody told me Danson was there. It's just at the end. You just get a, oh, okay. John Hughes I'll movies, you, all, you always got to watch till the end. You got to watch, watch for that again. nugget. They okay. did it before uh, The Hangover did it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was a precursor to all of it. 
That's right. You guys, John Hughes, uh, did he just like randomly have a heart attack and die? I can't remember. He did. He was uh, 58, uh, had no previous condition, was walking in New York. He was visiting his son, who had just had a baby, I think, or just gotten married um, and just was going for a walk and died right on the street. That is so sad. It's horrible. It's completely terrible. I would do anything if somebody ever wrote a book about him, right? Like right now, I I just heard this on some radio show that Ethan Hawke has just put out this documentary about um, Paul Newman oh, and yeah, John yeah. Yeah. I yeah. just saw it. I saw it last weekend. It was really, really good. And it's um, it, what, what Ethan Hawke said, but it was like this thing that Paul Newman started himself and then was like, forget it. I don't want to do it anymore. But they have all of the stuff showing all the interviews and stuff. And that's what I would like about John Hughes. I would love his wife or one of his children to do something like that, to honor him and then get all these people that worked with him to explain how the movies went, you know? It would be interesting. He was very, it's funny because he did National Lampoon and he was the screenwriter on National Lampoon's Vacation. And then he started making Mr. Mom and all these things. All through the 80s and then much into the 90s, he was always working. He always had a movie coming out. Yes. And then yeah. he just stopped. Yeah. And then he was gone for like a decade and then he passed away. And he didn't do any interviews. He, nothing. Well, and that's I, why it's so interesting, right? Yeah. So I, I feel the same way as you. I'm like, did he keep a diary? Did he have a close friend that he talked to? Like, I mean, like, it would be really interesting what, what was really going on in his head, like when he was doing things. I want to know about him and, and uh, Molly Ringwald, like what was going on there? Because they were, she was his muse and then they broke up. Like they had a friction or yeah. fracture in their relationship. Like there's certain people he worked with. Like I would be really interested in hearing about like what that was like what was going on yeah because you 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 know about all these movies of course i mean you know breakfast club 16 candles i i stand by 16 candles as being one of the best movies of all time i know lots of things in it now are problematic but i am with it, you on this one mary I, Payne. I, I, way better way better than pretty in pink people are like pretty in pink i'm like pretty in mm -hmm. pink sucked ass compared okay to 16 candles margo and i did an episode on pretty in pink and what they do to Annie Potts in that movie is unacceptable. Yeah. Like, <laughs> she is rad. And then they do this whole thing where like, they just like make her over and she looks like everyone else at the end. And now she's going to be happy. I'm like, she was awesome the way she was before. They did that to Ali Sheedy. In the yes. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Conform, unacceptable. Conform. conform <sighs> interesting woman. That, yeah, I didn't realize that. Listen, Ali, she did need to get rid of her dandruff. That was true. <laughs> That's she true. Some, shoulders. That's all. Uh, yeah. yeah, she did a little better hygiene, I think. But um, we talk a lot about teeth on our podcast. And Ali, she is one of these people who had very, very bad teeth. But somehow it worked. Somehow it worked. Yeah. And you are right about 16 Candles. It is very problematic but it is a movie that i am incapable of watching without my nostalgia glasses like yeah I, oh i can't I, yeah the Every scene with paul dooley and molly ringwald just talking yeah you know it's so sweet and and just i'd never see anything like that before like a dad and his teenage daughter connecting mm -hmm. it's yeah. so sweet it's so lovely the one with the the grandma with the long ash and they're like holding the spatula <laughs> underneath it. And the grandma's like, oh, she got her boobies. And then she fills her up. I mean, this there's so many classic. And then the the um the sister that took too many Xanax before her wedding is oh like, Whoa! like jumping so around like funny. Lick, licking the air. And um, I just, say at least once a week, it's a piece of cake bread. <laughs> <laughs> Like once a week. <laughs> See, there's things like this that like she's having a baby, like for some reason, like I didn't, the friends that I have here in Virginia are not the friends I grew up with in Mississippi at all. Right. Like, I mean, I did not know them until I was in my late twenties, but because of that movie, I and mean, I was just talking about how much we love it. You know, we didn't see it together. We didn't even know each other when yeah. it came out. Right. But it's just something that has really, um, you know, bonded us things like that. And things like, um, 
Uncle Buck is another one. I, I, I say you guys g- give that one another gander because I love Uncle Buck. I'm a huge Same. Buck supporter. L- really Laurie, Laurie Metcalf in that movie just Ugh, hilarious. And whoever is that girl that played oh. the bitchy teenage daughter, she was she was Mary later Lisa something. Yeah, she was later in a TV show um, that I can't remember that I loved. Yeah, and I, was, I loved it because she was on it because I loved her from Uncle Buck. And I, that was the teenager I aspired to be. Was that yeah. goth, dark, like I'm so crazy teenager. I like, loved I, her clothes too. Mm-hmm. I also, by the way, John Candy, there's a, at least once a week I do this. Um, I hearing music and I don't know what it is. And I'll say out loud, what is this? The grassroots? Because <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I'm a dork. That's why we do a show called Dorking Out. There are so so many things I could dork out over. And that's when Margot came on um, Pink Shade and was talking to us. And she was like, I could dork out about this. I was like, wait, you have a podcast called that. But it's it's, for real. There are some things like, for example, GMA Mary's husband dorks out about, you know, like Bruce Springsteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm not ever going to dork out about that. I appreciate Bruce Springsteen. I understand he's a national treasure, but I'm never going to dork out about it. I will dork out about Eddie Vedder, Pearl Jam, all day, air day. Is right? he your like boyfriend? He's my boyfriend. Like he doesn't know he's my boyfriend. <laughs> well, <but> I will. <laughs> he knows it. Um, yeah. We've he talked. got married and had kids, but yeah. he's still my boyfriend. No, no, he knows. And he knows. It's, it's funny that you say that because just last night I was at dinner with GMA Mary. She's making a lot of appearances here. I was at dinner with her and we were just chatting and she was telling me about meeting all these new lacrosse parents because her daughter's going to college on a lacrosse scholarship. And it was like meeting all these other families. Right. So she's like, yeah, these are like people that are going to be in my life for the next five years. So I got to get to know them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, ho- hope it goes well because these parents, they're all in the same sphere together. And she was telling me about all the different characters that she met. And she's calls this, she kept calling this one girl Pearl Jam Deb. <laughs> and she was like, she was like, Pearl Jam Deb, I told her all about you and how the two of you would be best friends. So if you ever come to a lacrosse match or game or whatever they call it, she's like, you'll have to meet Pearl Jam Deb. I said, well, if you're calling her Pearl Jam Deb, automatically we're friends. Yes. But also now I feel intimidated that she will have more Pearl Jam knowledge than me. And I don't like that. I like to be the one with the most knowledge. Are um, you in the 10 club? Yeah, since day me one. Me too. I'm on like going on, going on like 30 years. So Same. when the tic- when the when the tickets come out, Margo, you laugh. Um, when the tickets come out, I guess who's uh, first, second, third row? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I get the single every year. Uh-huh. I get I, Same. Yeah, yeah. No, Petty. I mean, Eddie Vedder. I feel like, you know, in our 70s, we'll actually finally meet up in person, and he'll be like, "Oh my God, there you are." And we'll like live together in Brooklyn and hang out and <laughs> right. we'll go for walks across the bridge. And yeah, I, I love them. I love, do, love do you care? Jim. Do you, you follow him and his kids and his wife and everybody on Instagram? No, I uh, you need to hop on that. I, on I, that. I know I, I follow other people. I, yeah, no, but I love their music. I, I listen to them every day. I love them. But I also, um, I have a friend that's a Springsteen geek mm-hmm. and she's actually traveled the world to see Springsteen. Um, yeah. We feel a lot yeah. of things that they dork out about. And yeah. I think it's great. I think cause life is short, find things that give you pleasure. Yes. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> there's a lot to be upset about and sad about. So when you find things that make you happy, you know, enjoy it, go for it. Is that how you guys, and now I'm turning into uh, interviewer mode, you're, you're is, fine. That, is that how you guys uh, decide to start this podcast? Like, how did you just, I mean, Actually, here I go. No, you're now, fine. Now let's, I'm, now, I'm all, let's, now, you know what? I'm Some, interviewing you. Uh, yeah, a go. listener actually wrote on our Facebook wall asking us to talk about stuff like this sometimes because she's like, I haven't listened from the beginning. How did you get the show together? So I'd like to know. I'm yeah. like happy to answer it. Actually, this show I started it with another friend of mine named Smith and we were doing it together and we would talk about movies and TV and things like that. And then he just dropped, he didn't want to do it anymore. He was working on other projects and I had heard Margo on F this movie and Uh I thought, and she was talking about my best friend's wedding and I was like, that chick fucking gets it. And so I, tweeted to her like how much I enjoyed her show and then we just started following each other on Twitter and I asked her if she would come on dorking out as a guest Mm -hmm. and it was like 
fire. Like the second we got together, I was like, oh, my God, Margot's supposed to be on the show with me. This is what we're doing. And so yeah. she just kept coming back over and over. And eventually I was like, will you marry me? And like, <laughs> yeah, you know, and now we do the show together. And then we that's, and she that's, came up with what a creep and asked me to do that with her. That's yeah. so funny because that's very similar to the story of Aaron and I on Pink Shade because she had Pink Shade with Aaron Martin for about a year before I started my podcast, my old podcast, which was Pain in the Pod. And I started going on Pink Shade with Aaron Martin as a guest um, because she like put out something on her Facebook group like, hey, does anybody like feel like they could talk about Vanderpump Rules? I was like, coach, put me in. I'm dying to, <laughs> dying to talk about Vanderpump Rules. And then I started talking to her about like, hey, I'm thinking about starting this podcast, Pain in the Pot. And she's like, you should totally do it. It's a great idea. And then that's sort of how then we started. I was, went on with her once a week and then we decided to do a side Patreon. And then, like you said, we decided just forget it. We only want to be with each other. Let's get married. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Talk about Pink Shade a little bit just for our audience. Yeah. Let, let, let them know what well, you guys, what y'all are about. Well, Sonia, I do want to know if your former co-host Smith was uh, Smith from Sex and the City, Samantha's boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, no. He is one of my oldest friends. His name is Chris Smith. And he is uh, not that. He is not. The, OK, all right. So he's not that guy because you very rarely hear a person named a male. Well, I'm from the South, so I, yeah. mean, I hear everything. But uh uh, you're like, oh, his name is Smith. I oh, like, no, well, sorry. His, his name, his name is uh, Christopher Allen Smith. And I just have always called him Smith. Like, okay. Ever since we were like teenagers. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. My high school boyfriend's name was Alan Smith. So I got you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Pink Shade. So on Pink Shade, we cover reality TV, right? Margot knows we mm -hmm. right currently. So normally our normal thing that we've been doing for the years is 90 Day Fiance, Love After Lockup. But right now, Love After Lockup was gone for a while. So we were like, well, what do we do? Because we had put out these two Monday, you know, Monday, Tuesday shows. So we started covering Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, which we love. But we don't generally cover like full length Bravo shows, you know, from the minute, of, you know, we just usually don't. So that's why we, Margo came up. Margo had sent me an email like, hey, if you ever need anybody for any of these shows, I, I was like, well, guess what? I need somebody for Real Housewives of Beverly Hills this week. <laughs> so that worked out. So currently we're covering Real House of Beverly Hills and 90 Day Fiance. And now Love After Lockup is starting back. So we're going to have to cover both of those on one episode, which means we'll zip through 90 Day Fiance because Love After Lockup is so much better. Um, then what we do on Thursdays is we put out a best of Patreon so people that don't have Patreon can get a glimpse of what we do over there. Because over there currently we are covering three shows – Three shows on the weekend. So we cover Seeking Sister Wife, Welcome to Plathville, and The Family Chantel. These are all what we call B-list shows. <laughs> we've got those on one episode. And then on another level, we we usually cover do documentaries, but we're currently covering um, Real Housewife Ultimate Girls Trip. Which oh, Margo, that's the best. Margo, you watched it, yeah? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I love them both. Dorinda did herself no favors. Nope. This season. She mm -mm. really, really, boy, she put herself on pause forever. I 100% think she's, she's going to, well, that's I what know. she keeps saying. I I'm know, that's what she does. Uh, yeah, and they're like, uh, you mean fired. <laughs> you mean um, fired, right? <laughs> that's what Andy said. Andy said. And, and that's what Andy said. So Andy I, says. I, I, I you don't bring, don't bring good food upstairs. Why is it so hard? Are you going to talk like a child? I'm going to do you like a child. I'm sorry. I, I do that too around the apartment. I'll start talking like Dorinda. I mean, live your best life if you're talking right. like Dorinda. Like, hey, you don't respect you don't respect the don't respect the the manner. So she, you know, what's interesting is that I've really been tuned into listening to everything Andy says because, like Casey Wilson or other podcasters that talk about Bravo, have said to Andy on his radio show or on Watch What Happens Live, like, "Woo, Dorinda!" Like can see what the rest of everybody else with the eyes can see. And he really is just like, well, you know, it was st stressful because she had it at her home. And I'm like, I 100% think she's going to be on legacy. She's going to be on real housewives mm. in New York. Legacy. yeah. Yeah. They're not going to get rid of her. I don't think. No, I just, I, I don't think they're going to get rid of her because she is 
she's watchable. She's just an asshole. I mean, it's just, I think personally, I used to really like Dorinda. I used to find her, I thought, you know, she's kind of a mean drunk, but I thought like what otherwise she was kind of fun, but I think she did herself no favors. I think also, but I mean, at first I was like, oh, they just have it in one location. That's not really fun. But then I realized, no, that actually made it great because it really made them like interact with each other. Right. Yeah, right. totally, totally, totally. And I've been thinking a lot about who who is an ex-wife Sorry, that has I a ha- I think Dorinda's sending oh, some guests. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Um they I'm thinking to myself, like, what ex-wife has an has a home like that where they could recreate it, right? Because somebody recently posted on one of the Facebook groups like that they were sitting behind Deandra from Dallas on a plane and heard her saying whoever that she was meeting with bravo and i'm like people are like because they're bringing back dallas i go no they're not she's meeting no. with bravo to talk about another ex-wives club show for sure for sure mm-hmm. but and, they wouldn't fly her in for that like isn't that a zoom call i mean i love deandra but she's not worth flying in she probably was like i'm, I'm escaping my house and my you know uh, yeah maybe we- she paid for weird it. husband and all his children with their weird names yeah. um so yeah she probably paid for it but i imagine like Cameron Westcott, she's got a couple of houses here and there, so they could do a <gasps> Ultimate Cameron Girls Trip. Would be great. She and Deandra, and you mix it up with, um, I don't Leanne. know. Well, no, because you can only no, have two for you. Gotta gotta have two from each. No, yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah. You gotta get a Cynthia Bailey on there. You gotta a get Teddy. a. You gotta get a Lisa Vanderpump. You gotta get a yeah yeah. You got oh Teddy Adrian Camp. Adrian Maloof. I mean, there's so many ex-wives that yeah. they could, well, I don't want this to ever end. I don't want it to ever end. I want it yeah. to go on forever and ever. The Real Housewives, Ultimate Girls Trip, ex-wives, the ex-wives, great. the ex-wives yeah. were so much better. We we thought season one was great, but we didn't know about ex-wives and how great it was going to be. We didn't know. The oh, desperation. So yes. The, the, the narcissism. <laughs> the how thirst. Much they, the thirst to be on Peacock. It just, it, it, it's, it's a chef's kiss. It's so much fun. Totally. I love Peacock. Yeah. It's been great. So that's what we're covering on Pink Shade. And we just, you know, by Saturday, which is today, I usually have a zero voice, but we did not record our two hour episode yesterday. Uh, Aaron had a car issue. So we're recording it today. So by the end of the today, I will be completely mute. You're going to be a zombie. (laughs) (laughs) And there'll be dogs barking in the background and teenagers uh, misbehaving. And uh, yeah, it's all that working from home, you know. Yes. So yeah, we always, so Mary Payne, we always talk about, um, we talk about some trivia. And then we always talk about for every episode, the top 10 hits that happened that day the movie was released. Okay. Would you be interested in hearing... Would you all want to hear the top 10 hits for that day? Because it's really good. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Here we go, ladies. So it's February 6, 1988. Number 10. I love this song. Prince, I Could Never Take the Place of Your Man. I love that song. Uh-huh. Fucking great okay. song. Yeah. We, we talked about him before. Bruce Springsteen, Tunnel of Love. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Foreigner, Say You Will. Okay. I don't remember it. I love this song. Pet Shop Boys and Dusty Springfield. What have I done oh, to deserve this? That's Great a song. good one. Uh, Eric know. Eric Carmen, Hungry Eyes. Uh, dirty, oh, yes. Dirty. Wait, wait. Dirty Dancing, right? Dirty Dancing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Roger, I Want to Be Your Man. I uh, know I, uh, you know I would know this one. That's one of those R&B slow jams. Oh, okay. I want to be your man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love this song. Expose, Seasons Change. Great song. I love them. Okay. Um, In Excess, I Need You Tonight. Oh, Michael Hutchins, another oh. one that didn't. Oh, uh, did, He didn't know he was my boyfriend, but he was. So hot. So hot. Uh, the Bangles, ha- Hazy Shade of Winter. Great song. Uh, less Than Zero. Yep. 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 And the number one song, 1988. Tiffany could have been. <laughs> I'm not T- kidding, guys. Tiffany is a, another one of the... Tiffany and Belinda Carlisle both had this gorgeous red hair that I was mm-hmm. just coveting at this age and waited. I wasn't allowed to dye my hair until I turned 18. 
and the mm-hmm. second I turned 18, dyed my hair red. Tiffany and Belinda Carlisle are to thank for that. Well, Tiffany's was real and Belinda Carlisle's was dyed. Correct. And I wanted to, as a as a redhead myself, I want to tell you that it's it's not fun to have red hair as a child. But when you get older, you appreciate that your hair is a little different, mm-hmm. you know. But when you're in uh, middle school and elementary school, it's uh, not so great. Just g- going to let you know yeah. that you were you were good to do it when you were older. And yeah. I've kept that red hair all this time. Love it. It's on like still, still red. I did pink for a little while, but mainly red. My daughter's hair is currently purple. I um, love it. You love. Really purple. Really purple. <laughs> <laughs> like Prince purple? Yeah. I mean, like she went to the salon and had it professionally done, yeah. like bleached out completely root to tip purple. Wow. Good for her. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but she needs to get it redone, you know, cause now it's starting to grow out. And, you know, like I said, she's home from college now, uh, not going back. And she's like, yeah, I need to get it redone. I go, yeah, mommy's not paying for that. Yeah, girl. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Nope. It's so called, learn how to do shit on your own in your bathroom. <laughs> it's yep. called, get, in the words of Vicki Gumbleson, get a job, get a job, yep. get a job. Yes, yes, get a job, get a job, get a job, get a job. Get some insurance and get a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I love that top 10. That was awesome. Isn't that fun? I love hearing what what was the the thing it at the time. Yeah, it does. So huh? many. I wonder what the news of the day was because I wasn't quite 20. I was 19 at that time. But as you said, that date, it's very close to my husband's birthday. I was like, oh, wow, he was he had just turned 20 himself. I wonder what he was doing. I didn't know him probably doing the same thing I was doing, looking for gross girls in the bar. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we were all looking for somebody to make out with. That's, That's right. Clear. That's Absolutely clear. true. <laughs> this was super fun. I'm really glad that we talked about this. I It was a good rewatch, to be honest, because I hadn't seen it since the theater. I took so many screenshots, you guys. So <laughs> many screenshots. <laughs> we'll follow you. On. Yeah, you give, tell us where people can find you. Yes. Oh, yeah. If you want to follow the podcast on Instagram, we're at pink shade pod and we are like desperado for people to follow us because our our followers on instagram doesn't really match up to the amount of listeners we have so we started i started a campaign a while back just like literally begging people like i'm begging you get your dog do you do you manage a work account get that account to follow us why won't you follow us and it worked we uh we we jumped up a little bit but um, we're still not my whole thing was i wanted to be at ten thousand, right because at ten thousand, you could do the swipe up but then guess what they did? They took away swipe up. Oh, no. <sighs> yeah, they took away swipe up. They recently did a whole redo of Instagram and everyone's pissed. <laughs> oh, because she, Jesus. It, it was a goal, right? It's a goal. We haven't hit 10,000, but I was like, when we hit 10,000, I'll be able what am I get? What will my first swipe up be? It'll probably be a stupid TikTok about 90 Day Fiance, but what will it be? And then they took it away. And now everybody can do the like click link. And I'm like, well, now it's not special. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. follow us anyway, because I put up hilarious, if I do say so myself, hilarious um, Instagram stories about whatever show we're doing. So like today, I'll after Aaron and I record, I'll put up an Instagram story about the three shows that we're covering. And it'll take me a real long time to put it up, but it'll scroll on your screen for 10 seconds. But it'll have taken me, <laughs> to, it'll, have take, it'll take me two hours to do it because I'm old and technology. I'm like Woody Allen. I don't understand technology. <laughs> I don't know anything about tape recorders or technology. That's a why really good Woody, impression. I just don't understand why Alec Baldwin interviewed Woody Allen. I'm, I'm still mind thinks, blown. Because they're both creeps. Yeah, he thinks he's one of those people that thinks Woody Allen is innocent. Yeah, oh, exactly. well, okay. Well, now I'm very disgusted. Yeah, oh, it's, Alec, gross. Alec it's gross. Alec Baldwin. You guys have done... Uh, uh, Alan and um, Baldwin on What a Creep. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I go back and I need to go back and find those episodes. Then. They're probably on our Patreon wall. They are. Uh, okay. That's yeah. Okay, Woody Allen can... has apologists for sure. Like when that episode came out, people were like, "He's innocent," and we're like, "Fuck off." <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, he's not innocent. And no. you know, I um, I have a small claim to fame before we go, which is that I did see Woody Allen and Sunni and what appeared to be uh, a, an elder of Sunni and an older um, Asian woman. So it was the three of them. It was Woody Allen, Sunni, and this older Asian woman at 
the Polo Bar in New York City. Oh, so oh, wow. Thank you very much. That's the same night we saw um, Regis was there, RIP. Oh, oh. Regis. Yeah. yeah, he was getting in an elevator. To, you know, because there's stairs there at the polo bar, or you can go in the elevator. And he was getting in the elevator to go down with his with Joy with his wife. And I was like, Regis! I, mean, <laughs> I, I couldn't help it. I had two martinis, yeah. and I had to scream it out. I'm and sure he I, loved it. I know. I was just thinking the same thing. He loved that. He, he waved, and then as we were leaving later on, uh, we saw. Woody Allen and Sunni and an older woman standing there checking in because at the polo bar in New York city, there's one way in and one way out. And we have asked this because we've been a few times we've asked, like, there's gotta be a back door, like the celebrities and like, no, every person comes in the same mm. door and they have the, the person has to walk in the front door, walk through the bar to get to the major D stand and then to get their table to go down. So when we've been in there, we have seen all sorts of famous people walk by. And that's just, yeah, if you ever get to go to the polo bar in New York City, if they say you can only come at like 530, take it, Yeah, sit at the bar, have your drink, have your very early dinner, and then go back and sit at the bar because you'll still see the same people because they have to walk by you to go downstairs. Oh, that's a good tip. It's a hot tip. Hot, hot tip, tip, guys. I'm going hot to see tip. celebrities. I'll do it. Yeah, do it. Do it. Do it. You have to call one month in advance and they'll say, are you on our list? And you go, no, I'll take any reservation you have. And they'll either give you like 530 or 1030. (laughs) But if your reservation is at 1030, just go at eight and sit in the bar. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. tips. Hot New York tips from someone who doesn't live in New York. (laughs) (laughs) Better tip than you get from me. (laughs) Margo, where can people find you on the Internet? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Please follow me too. Um, Brooklyn Fit Chick, and I'm on the TikTok at Margot Donahue. My site is brooklynfitchick.com. You're on the TikTok? She is. I am on the TikTok, and I'm pretty good at it. Oh, can I hire you? Because we're dying. We have so many TikTok <laughs> ideas. <laughs> yeah, let's talk. Shit, man. All right. I'm going to, all right. I'm going to check yeah, that out, please, Margo. But, but please, yeah, please follow all of us on the social medias. We all put time into it. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can find me at the Sonia show.com and the Sonia show on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm there on TikTok, but it's mainly videos of my dogs or my uh, random store ideas or show ideas. I have a good one for Bravo. It's called Love After Lockdown. And it's about dating in a post-COVID world. Somebody should pick that up. Get on it, Bravo. Uh, oh, oh, TM, TM. Don't, don't let them get it without uh, paying you for it. <laughs> Trade, trademark, trademark. Yep. Um, okay, so you're both on the TikTok. I'm going to look right now because we um, really do need somebody to help us with TikTok. I have a list of ideas. And I asked my teenage daughter if I paid her $20 per TikTok, would she do it? And um, she said yes. But the problem is, is that she doesn't know any of these shows or these players it would take so much explaining i should just do it myself <laughs> you know yeah i trended we both trended a couple of times too like what we, yeah Shit. all right the sonia show brooklyn fit chick on tiktok i'm going yeah. to look it up right now tiktok for me it's actually at my name margo donahue okay m-a-r-g-o d-o-n-o-h-u-e okay and at Sonia Show and yep. Margot Donahue on TikTok. You guys, I'm so excited. You can follow us on TikTok at Pink Shade Podcast. Keep your expectations low, but we. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's actually a general life thing. My dad yeah. always said that keep your expectations low. <laughs> that's the key to happiness. And uh-huh. he's right. Um, also, please follow us on One of Creep. We just had an episode come out. Sonia did a great job. Oh, thank you. We talked about Matt Gates, that big piece of shit. Oh. And we're already getting lots of feedback on that. We also have a great a former rock and roll creep. He's dead. That's coming up next week. Ooh. So please follow us on all the places yes. for What a Creep. And if you okay. have suggestions for the show, you can email us at dorkingoutshow at gmail.com. We love to take requests. This was Mary's Mary Payne's request to yep. talk about she's having a baby. And you can find Dorking Out at Dorking Out Show on Twitter. I sometimes check the Facebook. You could go to dorkingoutshow.com to get everything you want to know about the show. This was super fun. Thank you, Mary Payne, for the suggestion and for coming on to talk about this. Look, when you guys uh, circle back around to Uncle Buck or say anything, I'm your girl. Please. Done. Do you know what? Erin, uh, my co-host, Erin Martin, she loves say anything. 
we talk about we all on the show constantly we'll just all of a sudden break out into Lloyd Lloyd Null and Boyd that's the song that they sang to Lloyd um after he got dumped and they're like you gave her a pen and she dissed you in your Malibu I mean you guys that's that's not John Hughes's camera crow but if you ever circle back yes to say anything or Uncle Buck I'm your girl we will definitely we have like, you back yeah we'll have to do it yeah I can done. Do it. my I can favorite do it line from say anything is the if you know so much about women, why are you alone at a gas and sip with no women anywhere? <laughs> By and choice, they, man. By and choice. The, and the, and the, they all stop. They take a beat and they look around. They go, "By choice." <laughs> and that is when. And, when, and then when Lloyd Dobler walks off is when they start rapping. Lloyd, Lloyd, Bill, and Lloyd. They start rapping about him as he walks off. It's the best. It's, it's amazing.